In spring of 2023, Choi University's International Art Center featured an exhibition of work from photographer Jerry Siegel entitled The Promise of Living, The Tender Land. During its run, Siegel took part in a panel discussion on his work, which included Richard McCabe, photography curator at the Ogden Museum of Southern Art, and Paul Barrett, curator of the exhibition. Hello, I think we're ready to get started. My name is Paul Barrett. I curated the exhibition uh, that I hope that you will enjoy all around you. Uh, we're here today for a talk between photographer Jerry Siegel, whose work is uh, in the gallery, and Ogden Museum of Southern Art curator of photography, Richard McCabe. I've had the pleasure of talking to both of these gentlemen uh, for a while about this exhibition. Uh, and I'm not going to take up too much time with the introduction. I want to thank uh, Carrie Jackson and Rachel with the International Arts Center here at Troy University. I want to thank uh, Alabama Humanities Alliance for sponsoring this conversation today, and also South Arts for uh, sponsoring the exhibition. Jerry Siegel has been making glorious photographs of uh, the Black Belt region of Alabama for many, many years. His work has been exhibited in museums and galleries throughout the South, uh, more than I can remember, frankly. Uh, his first monograph, Facing South, uh, Portraits of Southern Artists, has uh, been shown widely in, I believe, uh, six different museum yeah. exhibitions. Uh, Including the Ogden. And I've had the, the very great pleasure of working with Jerry personally on a number of projects in addition to the, the show today. Uh, Richard McCabe, as the uh, curator of photography at the Ogden Museum, has curated over 40 exhibitions, including a wonderful show by the late photographer Ralph Eugene Meatyard that I had the pleasure of seeing in New Orleans. Uh, also, Ramel Ross and other uh, photographers that you absolutely should uh, look up. So uh, I'm going to hand it off to these gentlemen and let them begin their talk. Thanks again. Do we need to turn these Hello, up? Hello, everybody. Can you Hello? hear me? Am I on? I don't think I'm on. Yeah. Turn Hello. On. Um, I'm really happy to be here today. Uh, I want to thank Paul uh, Barrett for inviting me uh, to talk today uh, and uh, of course my friend Jerry Siegel um, it's great to always be here and uh, Carrie Jackson's been so nice and professional all these people at the International Arts Center and uh, the great Will Jacks <laughs> old friend of mine who might have put the uh, was is it the worm in, in Carrie's ear is that the right uh, word that, this was all on their own uh, mm -hmm. he might have told, told, told him about me and uh, so I guess he I guess he likes me. So, uh, but anyway, I appreciate it. Will I knew Will from Mississippi Delta before he came to um, Troy, and uh, anyway, he's a great guy, great photographer. So I appreciate all you guys. Um, I, I want to just say one little thing. I do have a little connection with Troy. Uh, I grew up. My dad was in the Air Force, and he was stationed at Gunter Field in Montgomery, and I grew up in Montgomery for about ten years. And um, when my dad retired, he went to Auburn. From the military, he went to Auburn and got his master's degree in history, and he taught for over 25 years at Troy State University. Before it was Troy, it was Troy State, and uh, so I had a connection. And then my other connection to Troy is when I was about 10 years old, when we lived in Montgomery, uh, my dad and I we drove down here, and I I got my first dog here. It was a Brittany Spaniel <laughs> named Pat, uh, best friend I've ever had. And uh, that was probably 1969, something like that. But that, um, that's the last time I was in Troy. So anyway, it's great to be here. So, so Jerry. What do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> I met you in 2007 at the Ogden. And yeah. uh, you were about to, you were showing your work, which later became uh, Facing, Facing South. South. Yeah, yep. and I think the title of the show was Portraits of Southern Artists at that time. It wasn't yeah. even Facing South. So that's no. how I, knew, I met Jerry in 2007. Um, and we've been friends ever since. Ever since we yeah. see each other uh, every now and then, yeah. do good events. Do good events. Uh, whenever I'm in New Orleans, not so much recently because of the pandemic, but used to get down there quite a bit. 
Right, and we have several Jerry's pieces in, in the collection. I've always been a fan of his work, so I was really happy when, uh, when Paul uh, curated this beautiful exhibition, Promise of, of Living and the Tender Land, which is kind of an amalgamation of two bodies of work, the Facing South, the portraits of Southern artists, and then your Black Belt work, right. which was in, um, I'm sorry. I'm black Belt Color. Black Belt Color, yeah. yeah. So it's kind of an amalgamation of those two um, bodies of work. And so my, my first question is, and because I love this title, it's, there's an exhibition that just closed in uh, New Orleans uh, at, at our friends at the New Orleans Museum of Art, and it was called called to the camera, Black American Studio uh, Photographers. And I love that saying, call to the camera. Yeah. So what was your calling to the camera? What made you become a photographer? Um, I got interested in it when I was in college. A really good friend that I hung out with uh, shot a lot of great, what I thought were really great photos. There was mostly them camping, going to Telluride on the beach, partying. But I thought they were really good, and uh, so I got a camera because that kind of interested me. Um, and at the time, his girlfriend was also a good friend, and I kind of had a crush on her, and she said, let's do this photography class together. Um, my interest was more in Katie than photography at, at that point, but at the end of the first night of class, they did a slide presentation of all these masters' works. And I'm sure there was Cartier-Bresson and all this, the regular, you know, heroes of everybody, but the one that stuck with me was Deanne Arbus. And it just, something clicked. I don't think she ever went back to the class. I don't remember in the class, but at that point I started spending all my time, you know, luckily I had fertile ground. I was in Selma, I was in Mobile, and my brother was in New Orleans, and I spent a lot of time in New Orleans. So, I, you know, it became a passion, you know. Um, enough so that my father said, maybe we need to rethink school, and you know, you have this real thing for photography or any art schools. But uh, Deanne Arbus is, and I'm not the only photographer that's been pulled to photography by her. Um, yeah, when I taught, I would, when I taught photography, I'd always show the students slides of photographers they need to see, and yeah. it's always Deanne Arbus that yeah. just blew. Everything. Well, the other one that really made a real influence was uh, George Duro yeah. in New Orleans. And my brother took me to see an exhibit of his work in like 77. Uh, so that was a, that, those were right about the same time, and those were real turning points. Wow. And I was lucky to be able to meet George Thoreau and photograph him, which was a real treat. Yeah, he was great. I got he to was an interesting him, guy. So. Yeah. And uh, if y'all don't know, George Thoreau was a photographer in New Orleans who, um, his claim to fame really is that Robert Maplethorpe came to New Orleans <laughs> in the mid 70s yeah. and stayed with George and kind of co opted his aesthetic and took it back to New York and became a superstar while George stayed in re yeah. relative obscurity in New Orleans. And he's a star in New Orleans, but he's really not recognized as a great uh, photographer and painter that he right. is. He's now. really, his reputation is more as a painter in New Orleans, although he does, his photos are pretty incredible. Right, and Aperture just published a book of his photography about five years ago, so he's finally now being recognized as a photographer that he should have been a long time ago. Um, so, the I'm, I was reading Paul's introduction to the exhibition, um, <clears throat> Promise of Living in Tenderland, and one thing that really struck me, uh, he had a, a sentence that said, you know, that this exhibition or your photography is a, is an understated love letter to the artist rule upbringing. So I just wondered if you wanted to uh, speak about that. Well, I started shooting in Selma right after Deity died with the panorama camera. And I've always been an advertising commercial photographer. And the, the Facing South series started just shooting portraits of friends who were artists and it tumbled from there. Um, but the Black Belt series, I'd bought this camera because I'd found myself in sort of a stagnant place and needed to kind of be jump started and shot a few. And um, it just took me down the path of looking at Selma in a different way. So for the last 24, 25 years, I've been shooting there with sort of a, a real passion for it. And what was your question? I went off on done rabbit hole. Yeah, it's just uh, the, 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 uh, the line was from uh, Paul's introduction is uh, that this work is an understated love letter to your rural upbringing. Right. Well, I mean, I, 
I think I had an incredible, perfect childhood. Selma, in a lot of ways, has changed so much. In a lot of ways, has not changed very much. But I've had nothing but love for it my whole life. Um, there's a little bit of a love-hate now, but I still love the place. I love the region. I love the people. Um, I always said to anybody that would listen for years, what made Selma so special was the people. And so I just started shooting, and it started out with the panoramas, and I wanted to shoot things that were iconic to me. So I shot the YMCA, the temple, and I was doing it all with the 8x10 Deerdorf and realized that I, there was so much I wanted to do that I shifted back to small format cameras. And I just, uh, I look for things that are important to me, that, you know, not, and it's, some things were done with intent. I went back to my high school uh, to shoot Homecoming. I went to the fair. There were a few things like that that I knew I wanted to go back to. But mostly it's me just driving and wandering and finding things that resonate with me, um, to use a term, responding to home that I was in a show called. Uh, it is a response to home. It's all about things that are familiar to me, that resonate with me. And uh, Yeah, and you mentioned memory being... Oh, memory is a huge part of it. You know, there are things that I do remember, but I, I think p memory is a big part of it, but it's also exploring new parts of it. Um, it's, it's not nostalgia, it's more sen sentimentality. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we talked about that yesterday. I was, um, I'm, not, I'm a photographer too, and I photograph a lot of like roadside stuff, and you know, sometimes it'll be pigeonholed into nostalgia, and I, I, that's a horrible word in the art world, we all look at nostalgia. So I always say it's a sentimentality, and that's a, <laughs> that's a more, uh, deep, right. that's a deeper emotion than, than um, nostalgia. And I was actually reading some Walker Evans talks about that, nostalgia, right. yeah. not being in sentimentality, being so much. Um, well, I've referred to my work, and it's been written that it's more, um, it's more a contemporary view of the rural South. It's not the ruins and remembrances. And I do shoot signs. There's some signs in my collection. I mean, Would Jesus Still Worms is, is there. Um, it's a little bit different than ruins and remembrances, but uh, it has to be pretty special for me to shoot signs and old barns that are falling in and things like that. I'm interested in what's going on. You know, most of this work's been from 2000 forward, so it's, if anything, it's a contemporary view of the rural South since the millennium. And, and, and the idea of memory, you know, like I see the picture of their homecoming, um, Selma, and yeah. ticket booth. Yeah. So those are probably things you experienced. Those were definitely up, memory you're things. You're going back and you're seeing them, capturing them today. That was definitely memory. Those were things that I, that I wanted to go see what they were doing now. I had, I did have fond memories of high school, you know, um, uh, and the fair, even though all those memories weren't fond. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. my first date when I was 14, I threw up on <laughs> the girl I was dating and the other couple. But other than that, the fair brings back really good memories for me. <laughs> and so I went back and, you know, I've, I've shot the fair. I don't know, about eight different years. Um, I really, going back, you never know what you're gonna see. The people are incredible, the colors, the sounds, and you can always get a cozy dog, <laughs> which is Selma's version of a corn dog. Um, so, yeah, so you grew up in Selma, and now you live in Atlanta, mm -hmm. and you have a practice, a photography practice. You're a commercial, mm -hmm. editorial photographer. Right. Um, and then you go to Selma and photograph multiple times a year. So what do you think about, I mean, I think about the separation. Like if you lived in Selma all the time, I don't think you would see it like you, you have that separation where you live in a big city. Right. Which is a great di dichotomy. I'm so jealous that you can do that. <laughs> um, you live in the big city. You know, you can go yeah. out and get Thai food 24 hours a day yeah. if you want. Then you go to uh, you go to Selma and you. Anyway, I'll just speak to that. I mean, I think about that a lot. About it does give me a different perspective. Yeah. I mean, I feel like 
Um, we were talking about it last night with Will when he asked me if I was shot in the Delta, and it's like, I'm not the Delta, I'm the Black Belt, you know? And I feel like I'm really connected to the Black Belt, but by being away for, we've been spending a lot of time there now. Um, we've been spending about a week, a month there, but before that it might be two or three months before I'd go and spend four or five days or three or four days. So it's, I'm seeing more of it now, but having that separation from it and coming back with a fresh view and seeing what's changed and, um, you know, people's views on things and how the city's changing, how the rural area's changing is, is, is an interesting, different view for it. I, I think that's important to get away from it. I think if I lived there 24-7, I would still shoot, but it would probably change my perception of it. I don't get mired in, mired in to local stuff. I mean, we're much more connected than I used to be, but I don't, I kind of keep my distance and just shoot my photography is what I try to do. Right, and just that idea of seeing it with fresh eyes is yeah. what I'm interested in, because of course the metaphor I would use or the example of that would be William Christenberry, of course, who for 40 years from Hell County, which is close to yeah. um, Dallas County. But he taught at uh, Corcoran. Corcoran in Washington, D.C. for 40 years and would travel to Hell County every year and photograph. And I just wonder if he could have made those pictures if he lived, taught at Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And, you know, the, just his, the, his the stuff separation. was really different, though, because he was all about, pass, in my opinion, it was about passage of time because he, mm -hmm. I do, just because of my past, I, I revisit places, but not with intentionally saying, oh, I want to go back and see what's happened here. But he revisited things and has mm -hmm. this record of 30 years. Um, the other interesting thing was because he taught. Um, when I photographed him and talked to him, he only comes down in August because he was teaching year round. Mm -hmm. So he came down in the middle of August, which was to me my least favorite time to be there because it's hot as hell, mm -hmm. it's hazy. You know, the but that was sucks. the light. Yeah, the hazing it makes it the light just it's horrible. You know, um, for some reason you don't. I like the winter. I like those gray days that we've been getting. Right. Um, you don't get a whole lot of those cold gray days in in, in August in Alabama. But but is but we did we shot the same area and that's what I think is most interesting is if you look at the work of. And I'm not would never compare myself, but Walker Evans shot in Hale County and in Selma and Dallas, you know, in the same black belt area. Then Chris and Barry came around, and I've been doing it for 25 years, focused. Um, and all of our work is completely different, you know, different mm -hmm. sensibilities. Um, right, right, and that's kind of leads to my next question. I want to talk about the black belt in Hale County. Uh, which is different, but it's such a storied place in Southern art and history mm -hmm. and photography. And um, I want to do a little poll here. <laughs> How many of you guys uh, know who Walker Evans is? Raise your hand, Walker Evans. James A. G. <laughs> How many of y'all have read Let Us Now Praise Famous Men? My photo history is doing <laughs> Am I supposed to be raising my hand too? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I just read this for the first time about during the pandemic because uh, I was like, I, I felt like I knew the book, but I was like, okay, I got to read it and it's worth it. Have y'all heard of this book, Capturing the South, the most documented region in America? Has anybody read this? Well, this is all for your students, by the way. This is uh, homework assignments for them. <laughs> This is a great book, y'all. It talks about documentary tradition and photography in the South from the 1800s to the present. And there's a great chapter on Hell County and Walker Evans. And it really changed my perception of those photographs. So I really recommend y'all. Um, if y'all are interested in this subject, uh, definitely read it. Um, William Christenberry, of course, is a very important photographer who is from Tuscaloosa, Hell County, and photographed there for 40 years. Uh, who knows Christenberry's work? He's one of my favorites of all time. Uh, do y'all know Ramel Ross? 
yeah. We we did an exhibition on him uh, a couple of years ago. Oh, then I, who's seen his film Hill County this morning, this evening? Not many. It's on PBS and it's actually on Netflix, I believe, and, and Amazon Prime. You can, but it's a great contemporary uh, visualization of Hell County from the perspective of, of an African American man, uh, which is different from William Christenberry, of course, and Walker Evans. And of course, you have the rural studio there, um, and uh, you have um, Mr. Aaron Head, who has a. Uh, uh, studio there, so it's a it's a it's a hotbed of um, interesting art, and yep. I don't know where I'm going with this, but I don't know. I, I guess the, I guess the point is, um, I think the South. Okay. I, 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 when I photographed Clark Walker, I went back because I had to get his birth date and said, "Well, you're born in Montgomery, right?" And he said, "No, I was born in Selma." And this doesn't really relate necessarily, but I thought it was fascinating. And because if it relates to Selma, it's got to relate to the Black Belt because the installations are all this constellation, all the same. And he said his mom always told him that uh, Selma, the constellations above Selma, creates artists. And so I sat down after he told me that, and I spent about 30, 40 minutes on my computer, and I typed in born Selma artist. And within that long, I found 40 to 50 websites of people who identified as artist, not just saying, "Oh, I'm an artist," but they had a presence on the on the World Wide Web. Mm -hmm. um, and the people that that came from Selma, there's a list of ten or twelve that are all history book artists that I know. So it's a it's an interesting area that I think gets overlooked for all artists. This in in that Black Belt region. Right, and you know it's not Hell County, but it, it's close enough. It's the Black it's, Belt. It's yeah, it's thing. thirty it's, minutes. Yeah. <laughs> And you know that's driving. It's probably closer than that. As the how far is it? Is the fly cr crow flies? Yeah, not very far. But I guess I, I guess this is what I wanted to speak about. And this is such a great book, y'all. And the Walker Evans photographs are so iconic and um, important. And basically, what happened is in 1936, Fortune magazine sent James Agee, who was a writer, and Walker Evans, who's preeminent photographer of the 20th century, pretty much, it's arguably, um, down to the south to do an article on white tenant farmers. Somehow, I'm not sure how they ended up in Greensboro, Alabama, but that's where they ended up, and which is in Hell County, and they followed three tenant farmer families, the Burroughs, the Tingles, and the Fields. And, um, they did this, and James Agee wrote, did the writing, and Walker Evans made the photographs, and the article was never published in Fortune magazine, and uh, the book came out in 1941. Now, we know what happened in 1941. War came to America, so America forgot about it. They didn't want to, they didn't want to see pictures of poor folks in the South and read about the Depression, because now we're at war with the world. And uh, so anyway, but what happened in the early 60s is this book got picked up by the new uh, kind of folky, folk lore folks and the new um, bohemian kind of hippie <laughs> yeah. folks really found this to be their Bible. And in 1961, it was republished and it became an instant classic. And, um, but I'm saying all this because Half of the book, James Agee writes about the problem of being a writer and the idea of privilege, uh, uh, privilege, privilege, privilege of pay, perception. Play, perception. Yeah, and you know, being an outsider and coming in here and writing about folks that are from a different class, a different social strata, and just the ethical and moral questions that come with that. Um, and the, fam the most famous passage is, he, he says, you know, he talks about how words don't do justice to, uh, to, to the situation that these folks live in. And he, and he said, um, if I could do it, I would do no writing at all here. It would be photographs, and the rest would be fra fragments of cloth, bits of cotton, lumps of earth, records of speech, pieces of wood, iron, pillars of odors, plates of food, and excrement. Yeah. 
So I guess, I guess I'm saying all this to say, what, ethically as a photographer, Jerry, I mean, and I, I think it comes through in your pictures that they're very ethical and there's no idea of exploitation or anything in your work. And I'm just wondering your modus operandi when you go into the community. Um, you're an insider in a way, yeah. you know, as opposed to well, Walker Evans and James Agee. And at the same time, you know, a lot of folks you photograph, you know, can be poor. Yeah. Uh, different social strata. So just the, I guess the ethical and moral questions you might ask yourself and how you deal with that situation when you're photographing on the street in Alabama. And then also, well, go ahead and a answer that question and I'll ask you some. Well, I think it all comes down to I'm fourth generation Selmian. It's home to me. And I'm, when I'm out shooting, I, I just love the connection with people. But the biggest thing, and it's things I've talked about in a lot of talks that I've done where I've done presentations, is it's about respect. And regardless of who the people they are, I respect who they are and what they're doing. I mean, and it's, it's across the board. Um, there's a little girl in the back who photographed her and her family, and she's got a little love bug thing on and it, uh, with the Confederate flag in the background. Um, and I think I could have sold some of those pictures. Some of them are pretty of her, the rest of her family are pretty harsh and striking and there's an SS tattoo and there's some other stuff and I think that those could have been sold commercially but I won't do that because I can't control how those images will be used and these people I stopped and said hey how y'all doing y'all they were hanging out in the back of the truck and you know I won't say that the confederate flag when I went by the first time didn't catch my attention but once I started talking to them we talked about Alabama football uh, my father had some property down the road. is on the old Birmingham Highway. We talked about motorcycles. I spent like two hours with them. I mean, I didn't even realize till later and recognize that it was the SS tattoo tattooed on the stomach. Um, so there's just a respect that I give them that they give back. And when you, you know, I wouldn't say Mama was, her religion was more the golden rule, do unto others. And so I try to treat people right. And if you are open and honest with them and tell them what you're doing, then you get that. And I, and then, like I said, those images, there's probably some other ones that I could have done things with, but there's a certain level of if you invited me in your yard, invited me in your house, you know, I'm happy to show them in a show. I'm happy to sh hopefully show them in some museums and things, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna sell them and put those people in a, negative light since they were good to me. Even if I disagree with their politics and a lot of things they feel, you know. I was talking to my wife, I said, good thing I didn't have my yarmulke on, <laughs> you know. But there was no, we just talked, you know, like, like Richard and I would sit down and talk last night or Will and I were talking, I talked to them the same way. You know, we didn't talk photography, we talked about Alabama football for a long time, you know. Um, you can always find common ground with people and that's what I always try to do, even when I, sh We'd go shoot, you know, CEOs of corporations, you know. We'd be pulling lights out and setting stuff up, and I'm constantly looking, oh, okay, his kid plays soccer. Oh, he's played at Pebble Beach. We have a lot of stuff that we can connect on. And when you connect with people, then they mm -hmm. connect, that connection allows them to trust you, and you get a, to me, I think about this more as a portrait, you get an honest portrait. Because if they trust you and they'll kind of let their guard down, then they'll finally, you know, at first they're, you know, in front of the camera not knowing what to do, but then finally they just go, <sighs> and they just kind of fall into it. I've seen CEOs do it so many times talking to people. At first they're like, who are you? Why are you pointing the camera? But the more you just kind of hang out without, I never jump out of the car with my camera in my hand. If I'm walking and telling my show, I never jump out of the car with a camera in my hand. I jump out and I, you know, I connect with them. Uh, yeah, that's the Does that way. sort of a, I don't know if that ex answered the no, question, no, that's but that's great. kind I mean, of. When I taught photography, I'd tell my students, they'd be like, you know, if you want to photograph people on the street, there's two ways you do it. One, you try to make candid pictures and they don't know you're taking their picture and you're risking getting punched out, you know. Mm -hmm. Or you can ask them, can I take your picture? Um, because, and that's the proper way to do it, you know. But you get a different picture. Right. Uh, you get, you get a definitely a different picture. You know? but I, I had a good friend a who went with me to Selma and we went to Pink Lily and we went to a bunch of places and 
You know, she jumped out a couple of times, and I said, wait, 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 you know, and she said, shoot first, apologize later. It's like, I can't do that. That's not me. And I hope that that's, if anything, it resonates with, you know, the things. It's, it's, a, it's a respect for the people and the place. Yeah, and uh, I showed y'all, showed you that little video yesterday. I have Alex So, the very important contemporary photographer. I don't know you, you guys know who that has did a book called Sleeping by the Mississippi, which was very important photography book the last 20 years. Uh, he, I saw this little talk he did, and he was talking about doing projects and saying, oh, I just want to do a project on the landscape. I want to do a project, you know, but, and he's like, it never works. He's like, you know, you shoot the landscape, you shoot still lives, but there's something missing. And he talks about, he's like, and I've always, I've always wanted to do one of those projects, but I can never do it, because there's always a missing element, and it's the portrait, you know? Mm -hmm. And he says it's the tension between the person being photographed and the photographer, just that tension creates just such a, like, you know, when you look around this room, you know, here's a landscape, kind of a, you know, vernacular architecture, then bam, it's peppered by a person, you know? And that just really adds, if it was just landscape and, and still life kind of thing, it would have such a different energy, but your portrait's really, you know, it's like an explanation point on the place. And um, I think I'm more of an intuitive shooter, because I've, you know, I've been asked a lot of these questions and I've talked about it a lot. Um, I did pictures that, I think it relates to a lot of the pictures I did, but I shot a whole series of the house that I grew up in, and there was a picture of the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the gallery director I was talking to said, you know, there's something about your pictures, whether there's uh, they're portraits or not, I mean, she was speaking mostly to the kitchen, she said, but there's always humanity in each of your pictures. And I'm looking at the blue one right now, and I don't know if there's any humanity in that, but but when you look at the the patch quilt barn or it's a cemetery, there is seems to be the presence of people or the absence of people, but there's something that touches on lives that were there. Um, mm -hmm. and again, it's not I'm I'm not a I'm not a conceptual photographer. I don't conceive of ideas and then go shoot projects. This project came about because I was had a new camera was shooting in Selma and it, set, it became, it's like, oh, well, this is a cool thing to do, you know, with the insistence of a friend. The, the artist portraits, I was shooting several friends in Alabama and Bill Island, the director of the Georgia Museum, said, you have a, you have a great series here. You'd seen like six portraits. Mm -hmm. You got a great series here of um, late career Southern artists. You should pursue it. So I'm just, I just, I consider myself, I'm not supposed to use the term shooter anymore. <laughs> it's got negative connotation. But I'm a photographer. I shoot. And I just shoot what feels good. And then if you shoot a bunch and all of a sudden you find out that you have these projects and series going. And I have a dog. And I walk my dog. And I always have my camera my phone with me. And I was talking to Paul about it yesterday. Um, and I have a stack about this deep now, and it's a new series that we're going to work on, and it's called Morning Dog Walk. And I really like some of those pictures. It's completely different. Um, I had a hard time with the term sense of place that we were talking about yesterday, and Paul this morning said, well, that's a good example because this is a sense of place of the South. Sense of place in the uh, Morning Dog Walk is Atlanta by the Fox on Peachtree Street. Mm -hmm. Well, there's definitely a sense of place in your, you know, black yeah. belt. I mean, it's, it, that's what resonates with it. And it's the, it's, it's the place, it's the landscape, it's the vernacular architecture that's very indicative of that region. And it's also the people are very different, um, the portraits and the intimacy of those. Um, I just want to say, I was looking at your book, Facing South, earlier, and the thing that struck me is how important of a document that is now, because Half those people have died since you photographed them. Close to 50 of the 100, yeah, last time I counted. Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. You know, and the fact that you got those yeah. images was just so important. Yeah. You know. And I didn't realize that at the time that I was doing it. Marilyn Lawford, the Jewel Colin Smith, is the one who told me that. Because um, she said there are a lot of people who have photographed Thornton Dial or Christenberry or Eggleston, but you've spent the time and documented to date, I photographed over 200 artists. 
all Southern. I mean, there's probably some that aren't Southern, but 200 Southern artists. Uh, well, that's a question I wanted to ask you. How do you feel about being considered a Southern artist? Do you like that term, or do you not like that term? Or? I'm okay with it, you know. I would like to get my work out of the Southeast. Not that I have a problem with it, but I just think to get it to bigger markets in different places, you know. I'm in a lot of museums in the Southeast, but I haven't been able to, you know, really push, you know, I don't know if I've made the attempt. I haven't done all the um, portfolio reviews in Houston and Portland and other places, but, but I, I am a Southerner and I am a photographer, you know. So I don't, I don't have a problem with that, you know. I hope it doesn't pigeonhole me yeah, well, into just being you know, Southern. Like Sally Mann embraces it. Yeah. I think Maude Schuyler Clay embraces yeah. it. I'm not going to mention a photographer who doesn't embrace it. <laughs> I mean, I consider him a Southern uh, photographer, but that's another well, what is What is a Southern photographer and what is a Southern artist? Um, I photographed a guy named Erwin Kremen in North Carolina, and we had a great shoot, and he wrote me a really nice letter after the fact and he said thank you for photographing me i love the prints i'm honored to be shot with all these people but i'm really not a southern artist he said i'm not from the south i grew up in brooklyn um, my work is not about the south i'm an abstract artist um, so i'm not sure how i fit it's like well erwin you've been teaching at unc for close to 30 years now <laughs> in my mind that makes you a southern artist you know it's because of place you know some some of the artists you know, um, I would have loved to have photographed Jack Whitten, who was, or I'd love to photograph Kerry James Marshall or Kara Walker. They're not considered Southern artists, but they're all from mm -hmm. the South. Um, so it's just, I take all that with kind of a grain of salt, you know, as long as somebody's not using it derogatory. Right, right. <laughs> well, that's the, yeah, that's the Ogden's mission. That's what we base it on, so on right. geom uh, geography. Right. Um, Walker Evans, of course, he was from born in St. Louis, right? you know, lived in New York, but he photographed in the South. So if you made a photograph in Alabama, that's, right. that's you know, an art. And some of the greatest photographers, art of, uh, photographers were not from the South who made images right. in the South. So, um, uh, yeah, and it goes back to, I think, what we talked about is separation from place and be able to see it with fresh eyes. And so I'm really always interested in people. Well, there's different versions of the South as well. You know, New Orleans is in the South, but New Orleans is a place unto itself. Right, it's um, Caribbean. Atlanta is in the South, but when you start talking about Atlanta and Charlotte and Nashville, and, you know, other places, Houston, they're definitely, when you go to those places, they're slower than New York or somewhere, but, and they have Southern sensibilities, but it's nothing like the rural South, small town mm -hmm. South. So there's different, you know, there's levels of what a Southern photographer is, a Southern artist is, Southern towns. Um, but I, I'm proud of being from the South. I'm proud of being from Selma. I always have been. I've always thought Selma was the greatest connector. I very rarely meet anybody that, ha does it, that has a connection to Selma that I don't know that person and know of that person. That's great. I mean, that's why I love the Ogden Museum. I just love the mission. It's just so special. and. Uh, First time I visited Ogden in 2004, I was living in New York, teaching and working at museums, and I gave a friend a ride to the New Orleans airport, and we, she's like, this is new museum just opened up and it's dedicated to art south. You wanna go to it? It's like, sure, and we went there, and I fell in love with that. I was like, I wanna work here. And it's a, a, year later, it's a great was, museum. And I've been there for 18 years, but the mission is just, the mission is just so special. Yeah. You know, and, um, uh, it's, it's, it's unlimited um, source material <laughs> out there. So, um, and speaking of Southern, uh, let's talk about the Southern Gothic tradition <laughs> and how you might fit into that. And uh, this is a, a, another part of um, Paul's, you know, statement uh, for this exhibition. He, he talked about how you might relate to photographers like Clarence Shaw Laughlin, who's from New Orleans, one of my favorite, great course probably the premier Southern Gothic photographer, I would think. Uh, Meat Yard, of course, who I just showed at the Ogden, just right. mind-blowing, the work is so, it's so good, y'all. It's so good. Eudora Welty. Right. Catherine Tucker Wyndham, who, if y'all, when you grew up in Alabama in the 70s, you read this book. 
like, I don't know if y'all still read this book, kids here, uh, but man, this scared the hell out of me when I was <laughs> eight years old. But I, I really appreciate it. That's funny. <laughs> that, that was another great thing about this whole talk is I got to reread re re some of these stories. So, uh, and uh, uh, Miss Wyndham was from your hometown yeah. of, of Selma, and you also did photograph her. I think she, she was there. a good friend to her my whole life, you know, family friend. and. She and my uncle shared a birthday, so yeah, there's a lot of connections with me and her. That's great, but yeah, this was such an important book when I was a kid. And uh, anyway, so how do you feel about, uh, I kind of look at the cemetery here, you know, of course you got some Spanish moths going on there. That's very Southern Gothic. I think there's a lot of representation of Southern Gothic. I don't think I'm a Southern Gothic in general, but there's a lot of things that I, seem to turn the lens on, whether it's a cemetery, the, behind this wall is the deer heads on the mm -hmm. wall. Um, there's a picture right to the, on this side of the wall that has uh, some taxidermy in a little country store that's sitting on top of the milk and cheese, which is, a, you know, I never did buy any milk there. Um, there's a place in Alabama that I, a lot of y'all might know. If you don't, it's worth driving to. It's not quite what it was when I stumbled on it in the late 80s uh, called the Cross Garden, and there's some images in the back from there. Uh, W.C. Rice created a whole environment um, based on uh, his family was killed in a car wreck, and the car is there, and it's acres of crosses and sex in hell, hot, 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 and warnings, and Jesus is the way. It's a, it's a really interesting environment and a place that should be, you should check out, out right by uh, Prattville. Yeah, it's, it's so I think some of those images definitely fit into the category, and uh, and some of the characters you photograph, you know, the people are definitely, you know, when you talk about it, um, most when you think about Southern Gothic, you think about literature, and you think about, you know, Flannery O'Connor, who was the huge influence on Ralphie G. Meatyard. Um, you think about, um, gosh. Uh, uh, Harper Lee is mm -hmm. a classic example. To Kill a right. Mockingbird, I think Bo Radley is right. the, is the quintessential Southern Gothic character. Boo Radley, however you say it. When I think of film, I think of Cape Fear with Robert Mitchum, mm -hmm. Johnny Cash, Murder Ballads. You know, <laughs> so that's all examples of of Southern Gothic. They're great examples, and I sometimes feel like the, the dumbest kid in class because I wasn't a good reader, so I'm not influenced by, I wish I could say that I could talk about Welty and Flannery O'Connor and, you know, it's just not in my literature. I'm, I'm Like I said earlier, I'm, I respond to the things that are, that I feel intuitively in my, in my gut, in my heart, and, and it's really all about connecting, connecting to a place that's important to me, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I wish I was deeper, I wish I was smarter, but I try to communicate what I feel and see and think with the camera. Do we want to, how, how are we doing, Paul? You want to keep going? You want to start taking questions from the audience or are y'all enjoying this? I'm going to say one thing, I'll get your question. Okay. And I don't know if this is really relevant, but I've done talks where I've had slide presentations and all. And from the beginning, I've always been interested in people and portraiture. And I consider all of this work portraiture. I did, within the realm of black belt color, there's a series on the 10 Jews left is what there were in Selma, now there's three. Um, so I consider it a portrait. I consider the black belt work a portrait of a region, a portrait of a small town, whether it's Selma or Marion, a small town south, uh, a portrait of a community, in the case of the Jews, holding on. Um, so I look at all of my work, whether there's people in it or not, is in the big umbrella of portraiture. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to say that because I think that's important to who I am and how I feel about all the work. Well, that's, that's great, and that, that was a question I was going to ask you. What's the difference between photographing Colin Powell or a celebrity type person in the studio versus somebody on the street? I mean, do you approach it any differently? There's the same level of respect. There's the same level of trying to connect. When I photograph Colin Powell, 
we had all the lights set up before he showed up. We were supposed to shoot him with 13 kids at the Boys and Girls Club. We were supposed to shoot him with another five kids. And I wanted that individual portrait for myself. So we had two lighting set up, set up, ready to go. He came in. I said, he'll be here at 2. Door swung open at 2, obviously military. And he was there, and he was his, you know, hey, doing, nice to see you. And as soon as he sat down, he turned it on with the kids, with all the Boys and Girls Club. I was just, you know, the guy taking the picture. He was polite and nice. But we did all three of those photos. We blew a circuit breaker and had to replug packs, and we did it all in 13 minutes. <laughs> Wow. I photographed Wallace Malone, who's the CEO of South Trust, and we literally had three minutes with him. I shot a Polaroid, old days of film. I handed it to my assistant. I started shooting with the Hasselblad. She tapped me on the shoulder and said, it's all good. I shot like a roll and a half. I grabbed my like and did a few in black and white. I said, thank you, sir. Appreciate all your time. So that's the difference mm -hmm. is with the commercial work, you really don't have a lot of time with these portraits it's important to connect with them before you make the portrait, because they don't know I'm coming. Colin Powell do always come, and a lot of the portraits, they know I'm there, and they know what I'm there for. You still have to give them the respect and connect, but you have to, it's just, it's just a difference in a commercial job and a, and a personal, personal assignment, yeah. I like them both, uh, you know, I love that, you know, having to be ready, having to be able to get that shot in just a few minutes. Mm -hmm. I always enjoyed it. What did uh, Ansel Adams said? Luck, luck favors the prepared mind. Yeah. yeah. It's so true. So true. Yeah. Especially if you only have two minutes to do a good <laughs> Right. Job. You had a question? Yes, I wanted to ask you, have you traveled outside the United States? And if you did, uh, did it affect you as a photographer and as a person? So it probably affected me more as a person. I haven't been outside the United States a lot. Uh, I went to Austria skiing, you know. I don't know if that really is a sort of thing, but I did. My wife grew up in Madrid, and so we went to Madrid, and, you know, we did uh, the bullfights, and we did a, a lot of things. We went to Retiro Park. We did a lot of things that introduced me to a different culture which was interesting. Um, when I'm on trips like that, though, um, and I'm with my wife, I shoot snaps. But that's, and I have some really good pictures that I happen to catch at Rotero Park and some at the Bullfight Park. Bullfight in a few places, but it, for me, I'm with my wife and we're on vacation and we're doing stuff together. Um, so I don't connect the way that I would like to. And I had a, I was given a birthday card when I was in college. It said, the world is a great book of which those who never leave home read only the first page. And so I always, another thing I've beaten myself up for is I'm not like my brother and my, the rest of my family. My sister just got back from three weeks in Cartagena, I can't even pronounce that, down in you know, Columbia. And I haven't done that much traveling. But I always will assert that if you spend time in rural Alabama and you get on the back roads, and I used to sh collect a lot of folk art, and you just drive up to houses not knowing if you're in the right place and knock on door and connect with people, you're going to meet just as many different cultures and interesting people in rural Alabama or rural Georgia as you will in Europe or South America. That's my opinion. It's a different culture. <laughs> it's a different way of seeing the world. I don't know if it's culture is the right word, but it's different people, different perspectives. And my brother said to me, you know, I said, I just have a hard time. Different languages and everything. He said, hell, there's no way I would get in my car and do what you do and drive around and knock on people's door wondering what is going to answer. So it's just what you're comfortable with. Any, Any other, other questions? questions? Somebody in the back? I'm Dr. Catherine Tucker, uh, not related to Wyndham, but I have the same name. Uh, I'm in the history department, and I'm here with my African American Studies class. And race is clearly a topic that is so deep in your work and in the region. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the role that it plays in your work and your perspective as an artist. If you would please repeat the question to make sure. Yeah. Everyone heard. Oh, 
had a, basically had his race play a part in my, in my work, correct? Obviously, there's a race in my work, um, and obviously I'm cognizant of the fact that I'm shooting African-American people and white people. Um, I don't think it plays a, a role in what I shoot or when I shoot or how I shoot. Um, a portfolio was showed to somebody recently and they loved the work and found out I was a 65-year-old white man. And they said, well, he shouldn't be shooting in the black belt. Well, I'm fourth generation Selmian and I don't shoot poverty porn. I connect with anybody. And if it's somebody that I find interesting because of the story I see, the little girl on the left, um, I didn't even see her when I stopped. Um, her grand great aunt, was picking wild collars on the side of the road on the way to Prattville. And I saw them and I stopped and I turned my car around and just got out and started talking to them. Um, some of the ones that have brought race into it a little bit more, um, the picture of the girl at the fair with the Confederate flag, I shot that in, uh, homecoming was in, the Confederate flag were 2007 and 9, and I can't ever remember which and which. When I shot those, people thought they were really great photos, and they became important images for me. After 2016, they took on a whole nother, right. a whole nother thing. And I had a couple of girls corner me at a show that was in and said, you know, why did you do that? What were you thinking? And I said, and this is the honest God truth. When I shot that picture, I don't remember the Confederate flag. I saw the girl and her braids and the gun and the color, the sounds and smell of the fair and cotton candy. And I'm looking at color and the girl and the gun. I mean, it wasn't, you know, because in whatever that was, seven or nine, the Confederate flag still, it just wasn't talked about in the same way. There were some people flying the flag and putting it on their car and people wearing T-shirts and bandanas, but it wasn't in the same uh, way of speaking about it that it's become. And there are several images like that that I've done that, and I don't know if, I, I call it intuition, um, that things have, you know, I, maybe it was there, maybe I knew it was there, but it sure wasn't a conscious effort of going, oh, wow, how, how I, you know, this is going to be a polarizing picture or, or create, you know, that doesn't play into what I do. Yes. Jerry, can you tell us a little bit more about where you're heading with your work and what you see, um, what projects you see coming in the future? Uh, these are long-term projects. Um, I plan to continue to shoot in the black belt as long as I can. Uh, it's constantly changing. The way that I see does evolve and change um, just because of, you know, I'm 65 now instead of 40 when I started. Your perspective changes. But I still love being out in the country, being in small towns, meeting people. The Artist Series is another continuing body of work that I will always do as long as I can. I have a show at the LSU Museum in Baton Rouge this summer, and it's a, a project on drag queens. And I really love it. It's a different way. Of, it's portraits. Um, it's kind of got put on hold because of COVID and have a health issue, so I wasn't able to do as much as I wanted to, but I'm hoping that will be a, I don't see that being a project that I continue like I do these, but I'd like to work on that. Um, the dog walk I've worked on for a long time and I've kind of gotten out of the habit of it the last six or nine months and I want to get back to that. But most of my projects are things that, uh, yeah, they're not, they're not conceptual things where it's like, oh, well, what would be a good project? They're things that I'm shooting that are important to me. So all your projects are ongoing? Ten Jews is not ongoing because there's only three. Mm -hmm. and, and that was a great project, and, it, and it, it's a great story. It doesn't have the depth of the other projects. And the people that do great long, long story documentarians, there's a bunch that we know, they immerse themselves in it. And I would go see the Gibeons and I would go see June and Seymour Cohn when I was home. 
but I wanted to visit with them. Um, I didn't want to, every time I came to Selma, go visit them just with the intent of being in their face with the camera to tell this story. I was more, it was more important to me to be with them. Um, Mary Ward Brown was an important Alabama writer, and I've got some really good pictures of her, but she was my best friend, and I didn't, I look at the work that Todd Webb, who did the work of Georgia O'Keeffe, who spent mm -hmm. so many years with O'Keeffe late in her life, has an incredible book and documentation of her work. That, you know, and they were very close, but I didn't want to do that. I didn't want, I wanted the friendship. I wanted the, what we had that we shared together more than I wanted the photos of her. So, I don't know how I got on that, but it, most of my projects are long term, but you know, the 10 Jews, it's, it just doesn't, that project doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. um, Yes. A uh, bit of a softball question, but uh, one of my favorite images is the uh, the one of the bait. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just want to know when you saw that and you said, "I need a picture of this." What went through your mind? Like, I laughed out loud. I laughed out loud. It's a little uh, curb market right over the Pettus Bridge. <laughs> on the left and I walked in. I love those little stores. When I'm out driving around at the end of the day, I sometimes have eight bottles of water in my car because I always go in without my camera and I walk in and I grab a bottle of water and walk around the store and see if I can connect anything or anybody. That was as soon as I walked in the door and I just laughed out loud and immediately uh, the guy that created that sign actually had seen it on my, somehow he found me and he wrote me a letter and he was uh, in law school, and he was working at this little store, and there was a problem with people coming in stealing the worms. So that's why he created it. <laughs> I don't know if it's one of my best photographs, but it's one of my favorite pictures. <laughs> Anybody else? A question for Paul. Can you talk about the choice of placement of images and sequences? Because you you created the layout, correct? Yes. Can you talk right. about your decision of how everything works in here and how you do when you go about? And Richard, uh, this applies to your work as well at the Ogden. When you have all the work laid out in front of you, how do you decide where it physically is going to exist in your space? I knew when we came in and Carrie was kind enough to provide the temporary exhibition wall behind Rich and Jerry that I wanted these amazing huge panoramas where they would get pride of place. Um, I don't know how many other institutions, I know the Montgomery Museum of Fine Arts sends a print of the, the birds mm -hmm. behind the two of them. So I started with the, the work that I felt like wouldn't make sense anywhere else and then looked for relationships mm -hmm. between Jerry's other work, whether it was subject matter or color or uh, in some cases even just you know, inside jokes or things that uh, Jerry has told me about some of the pieces and then uh, because I am very much a maximalist. I don't like to edit once I've chosen a lot of great art. I would rather try to include everything. The next challenge was to try to make it look coherent and also not give Carrie and the team of folks who helped us install this have fits. And if you look at the arrangement of some of the groupings of photographs, uh, as you may remember, because you also helped with this, um, we were able to standardize some things within the groupings. So uh, I started with the, my knowledge of Jerry's work and what would work in the space, and beyond that, trying to reinforce relationships and help everyone work smarter and not harder. Any other questions? Well, if there are no more questions, then thank you all so much for thank being Thank you for coming. Here. Please you. take time to